James Perwin. I'm Assistant Director of the Program on Negotiation. And uh, it seems very appropriate to be having this discussion of political polarization on, of all days, Election Day. I'd like to say we planned it that way, but we really didn't. Um, so we have two experts with us, and I'll start with Susan Hatziba right here. Um, Susan is a public policy mediator. She's done that for over 25 years and has mediated many cases across the policy spectrum for clients with a special focus on facilitating public po policy disputes. Uh, she is the director of the Sacred Lands Project at the MIT Harvard Public Disputes Program, and she helps teach the Harvard Negotiation Institute's course mediating complex disputes. She is also the author of a book, Civic, Civic Fusion, Mediating Polarized Public Disputes, and I recommend that book highly. Uh, Liz McClintock, next to her, is a founder and managing partner with CM Partners here in Cambridge. She has over 20 years of experience designing and facilitating negotiation, conflict management, and leadership training programs in both the public and private sector and domestically and internationally. Uh, her recent work has been with the World Health Organization, as well as offering strategic negotiation support and training in Nepal to the Ministry of Health and Population. Prior to that, she worked in Burundi, and she assisted the reform process in the country's army and worked to build conflict management training into the Burundian secondary school curriculum. Uh, just so you know, today we will be, be filming this, so if you don't want to be on camera, just we ask that you uh, move to one of the back seats. And um, I just want to tell you that both Susan and Liz bring vast experience in addressing complex conflict, and today their focus will be on political polarization here at home. So Susan and Liz, take it away. Okay. Thank you, James. Thanks, and James. Thank you to the Program of Negotiation for enabling us to be yeah. here before you. Um, so as, as James said, I've been a public policy mediator for more than 20 years. I've been in the middle of lots of conflicts, of policy conflict, cross-cultural conflict, religion-based conflict. And yes, yet when I look at today's political discourse, it looks different from anything I've seen before. Um, I know I've experienced, and my hunch is that virtually everyone in the room has experienced, uh, an inability to converse with people who hold very different opinions from yourself, from ourselves. So today, Liz and I plan to focus on the dynamics that constrain conversation across our polarized divide. Both of us are going to offer some of our observations. We'll talk between the two of us for a few moments. And then we're really going to open it up for a discussion to, to hear what you think of our observations and what you're seeing. So we're not going to engage in a political discussion today. We're asking you to come with us to the balcony to stand outside the substantive discussions, to observe the dynamics that we're living, and to offer suggestions about how to build, how to design a process that would enable productive interactions. Um, for the past couple of years, I've been studying and writing about sacred land disputes and conflicts that include a religion component. These are often identity-based conflict and clashes of worldview, neither of which are negotiable. In my book, Civic Fusion, I talk about identifying the deep differences and enabling people who hold those differences to bond across them in order to solve a shared public problem. So it's not a, it's not a question of looking for common ground, but rather let's understand what those deep differences are and with those differences intact, figure out how to address shared problems. Um, in working on worldview-based conflicts, mediators have to help people identify and articulate that collective framework that they use to understand the world around them and to act in the world. Um, many years ago, I co-facilitated talks among leaders of the pro-life and pro-choice movements here in Massachusetts after fatal shootings at two women's health clinics. And while we didn't plan on it, what emerged during those discussions was a need to identify the worldviews. And what we saw was the differences were so deep and so great. Um, when does life begin? 
a, a woman's moral agency to act um, on behalf of terminating a pregnancy. But once we, once we got to these world differences, the, the conversations were, happened at a much deeper level. So still, I would say those talks were challenging and productive, but again, different from what I'm seeing here today. I think we've got to go somewhere else to think about how to design uh, a process. So what I think I'm observing on, on behalf of some segments of the populace, I don't want to say that what I'm going to say is attributable to the entire United States and all the people within it. But one of the dynamics that I think I'm seeing is that we're experiencing what looks like faith-based conflict without it being attached to actual religious conflict. So what does that mean? Um, so I'm going to rely on Paul Tillich, who was a German philosopher and theologian. He actually taught here at Harvard in the 50s. Um, and he wrote a book called The Dynamics of Faith. He defines faith as being ultimately concerned. So to break that down just a bit, we all have concerns. We care about food, shelter, family, friendship. But he talks about an ultimate concern, the concern that supersedes every other. And because it supersedes every other, it demands and there's a willingness to sacrifice on behalf of that ultimate concern. And it offers, it, it offers a promise of ultimate fulfillment. Um, Tillich says this is associated with a drive to activate the human potential toward the infinite and offers the possibility of transcending ordinary life. What I find most fascinating about Tillich, and I would just add he moved to the US after he was fired from his university in Germany after speaking out against Hitler, is that he separates out the dynamic of faith from the focus of faith. So what he might call the ecstasy of faith, the experiential moments of faith, from the ultimate concern that people are pointing towards, uh, pointing their faith towards. So a person may express faith in an ultimate concern, such as a universal God, but a person may also experience the dynamic of faith in success, or the greatness of a nation, or a master race. So what I find interesting about Tillich is that he's identifying faith and the dynamic, that experience of faith, apart from what it's focused at. Now, he differentiates between a true ultimate concern and a false or idolatrous ultimate concern. Whereas the former would result in ultimate fulfillment, an idolatrous ultimate concern would lead to existential disappointment. Importantly, for how we would think about developing um, discussions or dialogue, he says that faith requires humans to move beyond reason so that the attachment to an ultimate concern is always linked to doubt. There isn't a way of proving that the, that the ultimate concern is an ultimate concern, so it always requires what he would say a conscious choice to set aside doubt, which he calls courage, in order to engage that, um, that faith uh, or that ultimate concern. So this is the dynamic I think is at play here in the US. I think many people on all sides are acting out of a faith, a perceived ultimate concern that will result in ultimate fulfillment. And so in our discussions, our attempts at discussions, there's no value in efforts to educate or persuade or to bring reason to the discussion because people are motivated by an attachment to an ultimate concern. They've taken a decision, whether conscious or not, to move beyond reason to transcend the ordinary. Thus, when we think about designing productive engagement across polarized politics, I suggest we may need to focus on articulations of these ultimate concerns and expectations of fulfillment from sacrifices on behalf of those ultimate concerns. In addition, if polarization is in part 
an expression of false faiths, then the design of productive deliberations would also need to rely on the doubt that people intrinsically share in the ultimate concerns they choose as their focus of faith. So let me stop there and ask Liz to share her observations on that are rooted in your experiences in Central Africa. OK, thanks, Susan. Uh, and again, we're wanting to sort of prime the pump and hope that you'll all be very enthusiastically engaged and vocal after we've finished offering our observations. So like Susan, uh, I've had about 20, 20 years, 20 plus years working in the field of mediation, more as a trainer, negotiator, consultant. Uh, and it is true that in all of my years of work, the divides seem more intractable, perhaps unbridgeable than ever before. But then I have to remind myself, perhaps I'm a little, my memory's a little cloudy, or I'm maybe just a bit too young. But as my friend Steve McDonald likes to point out, as a Vietnam veteran, when he returned to the US, he found a country deeply divided. Divided not just about the war, but about race, about feminism, about sexual orientation, uh, about identity. And he experienced tanks on the streets of Washington, DC. And so he brings a bit of, he reminds me to bring some perspective to this discussion that all is not lost. And in fact, we have been in very divided places before, um, particularly in this country. So I suppose for me, what's not so unsettling is that we have been divided. But in fact, after these, these years of work that we have put in as part of our careers, what's unsettling is that we're not able to bring the learning, the skills, the tools to bear on the issues that are dividing us today in the ways that we might have expected, that we might have hoped for. Um, so I, I, I'm prompted to think of my work in Central Africa. Why? Because we spend a lot of time in our field looking at conflicts out there. We, we want to go work in other places because we feel we have a lot to bring to those conflicts. And I have spent uh, and lived, um, worked in Burundi since 1998. Burundi, small country right next door to Rwanda, shares the same ethnic make, makeup generally and uh, has experienced conflict, mass violence in the same, very similarly to Rwanda, but with somewhat different results. Um, and I lived there for five years working on, as, as James mentioned at the beginning, trying to bridge um, inter-ethnic um, polarization and to uh, bring, help them bring some coherence to their uh, post-war life. And the two things that strike me about my work in Burundi that I think are particularly relevant to this discussion um, are kind of how you spoke about worldviews and worldviews being sort of uh, so foundational that they don't change very easily. Yet what I saw in Burundi and what, in fact, sometimes we were asking people to do was reconstruct a worldview. And, and so was the worldview so immutable or were we asking them to do something kind of unheard of to, to actually renegotiate uh, their view of the other that had been, at least in Burundi, you know, for 55 years or so, uh, immutable as it were. I'm Hutu, you're Tutsi, there are these things that divide us. Yet if you know Burundi and Rwanda, uh, you would know that, in fact, uh, their ethnic identities are in, not entirely, but in large part, constructed. They are not immutable. They're not uh, age-old ethnic conflicts that only have reignited in recent years. They were, with the help of the colonial power, but constructed. So the interesting part of what we then brought was, well, what about these skills and tools of dialogue, uh, assisting people to then talk about those very, what they thought were immutable worldviews, and then build a shared vision of the future? 
um, after the war, Burundians engaged in this process with a lot of enthusiasm. And the vehicle, I think, for them was the seeing the possibility of democracy as allowing them to use skills of dialogue, to have a voice in their future in a way that they had not had before. Frankly, irrespective if you were Hutu or Tutsi, particularly if you were poor, um, but certainly um, in a way that was very unlike their past. Interestingly, um, uh, Burundi is a somewhat more individualistic society. They don't have really villages in Burundi. People live on their farms on the hillside. And so um, the geographic disposition of people sort of reflects their relationship to the state and to the government, which ought to sound familiar for those of us who are trying to figure out what, how polarization manifests itself in the United States today. And we often refer to this urban-rural divide, and that's very true in Burundi as well. There's a very profound uh, divide between how people view uh, this entity, the, the government that is meant to provide services, um, actually help us to solve problems and create the context for which we would be able to resolve conflict. So I, I think this construction of worldviews is, is something we need to, to at least consider. Um, the second thing that strikes me about my work in Burundi, and which I find more worrisome as we look at polarization in the United States today and how we should be bringing our skills and tools to resolving some of the issues here, is violence. And something that I've noticed in my work around the world, but particularly in what could be described as deeply divided conflict, is how then violence becomes more acceptable. Violence becomes a very, the tool of polarization, if you will. And of course, that's mutually reinforcing. If I experience violence, uh, uh, at the hand of the other, then I, uh, the otherness grows, and I, I have injury and um, grievances uh, that I then affix to the other have ha as having perpetrated this violence. So the, what worries me now is how small things, bullying, um, and, and I, and not to underplay them, but microaggressions, frankly, are no longer micro. They're very overt. They're very, we are more aggressive towards one another. And how that violence then feeds into this polarization process makes it much more difficult to untangle, I think. So those two things, I believe, are, are really critical to helping us better understand how we might then, um, understanding those two issues, um, could help us better understand how our skills, tools, approaches might help us address polarization in, in the United States. Because I think where what we face today on election day is a profound erosion of trust in our democratic institutions. And they ex expect in the city of Boston that they'll get the lowest turnout ever uh, for the mayoral election there. Yet it would seem to me in what remains a I feel like in a largely segregated city, we should have more people coming to vote, more people engaging in this process. Yet between this issue of constructed worldviews and violence and their relationship, that trust in this democratic system has been eroded and we risk losing our ability to influence the future. So that's what I would add to this discussion. Um, to kick us off, what I thought, what Susan and I had done in advance, we didn't know exactly what the other was going to say, but we shared a few ideas. And then I have um, at least one or two questions for Susan. She also has a couple in her pocket for me. But I'll ask Susan a first question to get this conversation going, and then we really do want to open it up to everyone else. So if you have questions in mind, please write them down. Uh, we'll do our best to, to get to everyone. And again, in fact, they don't need to be questions for us. They can be general comments, questions for one another. Don't, we're here to catalyze this conversation, not to actually be the repositories of the wisdom by any means. Um, so because Susan has been patiently listening to me, uh, one question in light of what I've just said, I 
I was hoping you could say a little bit more about what you actually did, whether you're talking about your work in, with sacred lands or with communities on sacred lands or in, in the uh, conversations you alluded to about the abortion debate, because I think that touches on this issue of our, what our worldviews are, are they constructed, not constructed, and if how, how, how did you help people move beyond some of these deeply held values to have a conversation? So I want to introduce Barbara Thorpe, um, who was uh, one of the participants in the abortion talks. Barbara represented the church during those talks, so keep me honest. <laughs> um, so I don't think we tried to move beyond worldviews. I think that what was really critical is we were trying to surface the worldviews. So my, I think what I, and, the, and it's the same thing in sacred lands, it's the same thing in religion disputes. It's about what are the differences, what are the deep differences, and I think what was fascinating in the abortion talks is that once the worldviews were surfaced, um, some of the participants could not respect those worldviews or even tolerate those worldviews. But something really important happened, which I would say, knowing the other's worldview and knowing that each worldview actually was rooted in a sense of morals, uh, even though those, those morals were different, mm -hmm. led to a de-demonization of the other. Because now it wasn't that other side is evil or they're wrong. It's that now I understand where they're coming from. I don't agree with it. I, I reject it wholeheartedly. But now that I understand where they're coming from, I can see this individual person in their humanness as opposed to other. And I think that's something that you were referring to is mm -hmm. we're so othered now that part of what we need to do is deconstruct the otherness, even if the world views remain intact. OK, great. Thanks. Barbara, please. Do you want to add anything to that? 
Um, since we're talking about process, I'll just say a, a little bit about this hot button exercise. Um, one of the first things that we did was we asked people to, to say all of the words that shut them down emotionally. And we listed them out, as Barbara said, on flip charts. So the whole room was covered in flip charts with all of these words like feminazi and unborn child. Different people had different hot buttons. And then we asked everyone to have a conversation about the issue of abortion without using any of those words. And it was really hard because each word was code. It had a whole, if you opened up the word, uh, it would have a whole lot of philosophy and faith and um, ideas in it. So without those words, we were able to have a different kind of conversation. And of course, it was really hard to do. So there was a lot of laughter. And that, I think, was a beginning in helping to uh, create the bonds that started in that way. And I think as anyone who's worked in international conflict resolution uh, knows that that's often one thing that we do frequently is work on uh, through media. How, how is the conflict talked about? What, what, how does language perpetuate or help to bridge divides in communities? Search for Common Ground is quite famous for developing media programs, for example, around the world in countries in conflict to very much address this issue, as Barbara has raised, of language and how language then becomes the tool of polarization. So how can we then use it to become a bridge, um, a tool of bridging? Um, did I say a hand? Yes, please. Can you, and, and would you mind just saying who you are when you? Uh, My name is Gilead Hudson. I'm not a I, I understand a great from what you speak about the emotional part. <coughs> might be limited in that department. I, that, from what I see, there is, and I want to understand better, there, there is a spectrum, there is a place we agree, a place where the disagreement, the correct and logical and rational disagreement is unfolded. And then you have several solutions. So the Amish have one solution, or ultra orthodox Jews have one solution, they withdraw. Or the branch Davidian withdrew. Or if you're over pushed, you do the other thing the branch Davidian did, you rebel, or ISIS does. Let's take something over here. Uh, or you do what humanity did to most of humanity, is just put up with it because uh, Caesar was too strong to fight, and you just try to find a way. And in the middle, there is a place where you can disagree with tolerance. And actually, you do that when there is a deeper thing you both agree on. For example, we would like to live in a safe flow uh, in democracy, however it's that. So I, I, you are a murderer in my view, but, but this would be a far worse murder if, if I don't live in a safe flow. I start murdering people in the clinic, or I start murdering the people who murder the clinic. The clinic, the clinic. And, and the question is, is it about identifying this center? Uh, what do you do with the people at the end? Because I feel, to some extent, at the end. And since I'm not going to shoot anyone, I withdraw. But, but it's very painful. Uh, uh, what do you do in the middle? I wouldn't speak to any people who, in my view, dismantle what I find human. So uh, I, I, I think I understand your question, Gilly. Thank you. I think what. What I'm saying, and I think what Liz is saying, is that we can't even have those discussions right now. Um, and that's different. To me, that's markedly different. So even when we had the abortion talks, there was a cause to come together and a motivation to identify similarities and differences. It, what's frightening to me, frankly, is that the othering that's going on is so deep and threatens violence, I think, as Liz um, was referring to, that I'm feeling that we need to figure out how to gain entry into a nuanced discussion. Because the kind of primary colors that are being used to, to identify difference and identify who's in and who's out don't allow for the nuance that's required in a democracy. And so my question is, 
how do we gain entry into people's minds so we can start to have conversations? Because I fear that if we don't, violence is the next obvious um, direction this goes in. Liz? I do have something to say, but I'd love Could you introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Shula Hila. <laughs> Thank you, Shula. Um, I, um, I wanted to sort of ask to clarify questions that are related to one another um, before the practical issue of the United States foreign process. So one of the you Liz, were talking more about ethnic conflict, and you were talking about more worldview kind of conflict. And I'm kind of wondering if those cross each other. In other words, can you have people from one ethnic, people in a place where the main conflict is ethnic, do people cross that boundary sometimes with world views or vice versa? I mean, does, does, does that kind of happen? Or is it either an ethnic conflict or um, world view kind of conflict? Because it seems like some of the ethnic ones are overwhelming and you can't sort of switch uh, the other question is using the world, the word worldview, and um, Gilly was talking about a spectrum. But it seems to me, is it that a person owns a single worldview, or is the worldview maybe one worldview would be about the relationship between a person and his government, another would be about person and a person, or nature, or whatever. And if there are conflicting worldviews, is it possible that the same sort of groups that separate on a particular aspect of a worldview might find common ground on a worldview regarding some other very deep, serious issues? So. Do you want to start? Sure. So uh, taking the second question first, just, and again, I, I'm open to others' perspectives. Pew released its study on um, on how uh, Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives, um, have been voting, and how at no other time, since practically since they've been taking this poll, have fewer Americans shared even some mix of perspectives on a range of views. In other words, if you're conservative, you tend to hold a whole set of conservative views and there's very little ground, common ground that you have with liberals. And that's quite unusual. And it, and it, it because it, what prompted me is I was wondering, well, there are worldviews about, yes, about abortion, yet that might not be, those same people might actually agree on other things. Are worldviews issue specific? I, I don't think so, but I wonder, I wonder that raised the question in my mind if we did think differently about different issues. I think by its very definition, worldview would imply no, that we have a view of the world and our different perspectives fall somewhere within that, um, that, that worldview informs all of our perspectives about a particular issue. But I'm not so sure, uh, I, I don't know. And I do think that it's important to get at maybe the answer to that question because we might be able to find more common ground, Shula, if we're able to discover if people hold vastly different views on one topic but could come together on a, a different topic. And frankly, we try to do that all the time in conflict resolution abroad, right? We're trying to get people to agree on smaller issues, things that we can do together, you know, to create a container, as we say, a place where the, by the very nature of bringing people together and getting to know one another, then they might have such a relationship and some trust that they then can discuss these very different worldviews or more difficult topics. So I would hope that we'd be able to create some sort of approach that allowed for that. Um, but in the United States, I don't think we've thought about that very much. I think what you were saying that what we tried to do abroad and find sort of small issues, and you almost said the word small issues, is very different than finding very deep for um, what did you call them, concerns, the type of concerns that may be in common. So not necessarily on a policy level to find common things, but to deconstruct the worldview into 
worldview towards very deep issues that have to do with it. I see your point. I just I think that our worldview then informs how we view all of the issues. So, so, so I would just add to that because I'm fine with worldview differences. I don't. I can work in conflicts that have worldview differences, and I agree with your point that there are multiple. Uh, your your worldview may be different. It may be informed by different things. I think in terms of ethnic conflict and worldview conflict, part of what makes these uh, sometimes intractable is that the norms associated with ethnicity and worldviews are unsaid. And so we have to work very hard to surface them um, because they're taken as, they're taken for granted by different, they're different and each side takes their own for granted and it makes communication sometimes very difficult. I think I'm saying something that points to um, what Liz just said about this Pew study that it's not by issue. The differences are an issue. It's, it's the whole cluster, which I'm calling faith, faith. I'm calling that there's some kind of, um, there's some kind of uh, ultimate concern that's driving this, that's bigger and, and more difficult to access than worldview. That's what, that's what I'm trying to say that that you know, make America great again is an ultimate concern. And what does that mean in terms of, of people's actions on behalf of that and othering people who, aren't, who don't share that ultimate concern? That's, that's the worry for me, um, is that worldviews can be articulated with care. Uh, faith is something that's even that's much more difficult and more composite. Hi, my name is Sarah Leonard. Um, I'd be really interested to hear your views on what's recently happening in the Republican Party, because you were mentioning conservatives and liberals, like there's very little that they can relate to anymore, but yet you have senators like Blake who are announcing they're not running for president so that they can speak out against President Trump and what he's doing. Um, and he, they believe that they can't be elected if they do so, or re-elected if they do so. And so there's clearly some sort of polarization that's happening within the Republican Party. Um, is there anything y'all can speak about that? I'd be really interested to hear. Yeah, I, I, real, I, I don't want to avoid that, but I don't think I'm expert in that. I think I'm expert in designing processes that enable productive discussion. So. Um, what you're asking me is kind of an opinion, and it's not, it's, it's like, similar to your what, what opinion. What do you feel, I guess, has caused that sort of schism, maybe, in a party that used to be fairly, you know, I don't know if that's still sort of along the same line. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of putting it just in the context that I'm speaking of, I would say that those Republicans are not, don't have the same faith in the defined ultimate concern of other party members. And I think going back to the, what Susan said earlier about um, the concern that we have that we can't, there's lack of nuance, right? And I think this, I, I, I think just like on NPR this morning, you know, the differences in the Democratic Party and how the Democratic National Committee dealt with Bernie Sanders, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we're seeing schisms on all sides. I think there is no nuance, any, our inability to have nuanced perspectives about the world is really lost, it seems. And we're, we are struggling to recover the ability to be able to talk about and share some opinions and not share all of our opinions with others because we feel under threat. And I think fear is really driving than this setting up our camp. And we, if you, you see it, 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 I see it in Burundi where now it's, the government has changed its tune and 10 years of a lot of good work is unraveling. And part of that, they were starting to use language again and tried to reinsert a, an ethnic component to the otherness. So it was, it's a Hutu-led government majority Hutu, they still were trying to say, well, it's the minority Tutsis that's their fault that we're not having the, the progress that we wanted, et cetera. 
And interestingly, all the work on trying to change language, trying to change people's perceptions of the other has worked because that ethnic uh, focus of the other has had no traction in Burundi. So the government has shifted, and now it's Hutu on Hutu, and they've reconstructed the, the, the identities that are important and around which conflict now happens. And it, OK, so that ethnic sort of rubric didn't work any longer, so we're going to use something else. And it reminds me of what's happening in the, in the Republican Party in the sense of that we can't have just differences and be able to talk about those differences. So we, because we are driven by fear, about what our future is going to look like, and we don't feel like we have the resources to be able to design a future together, so I must exclude you, and now I exclude you based on a whole other set of issues. Liz, could you say a little bit more about literally the process, the techniques for constructing shared worldviews in that context? Um, Sorry. Yes, I'll hold this. Um, as in a, a as a tool to help mm -hmm. uh, create less conflict or to uh, yes. that okay so I think one thing that we've been talking about a lot actually at CM Partners recently is that one piece of work that we did was to work with leaders to work with their own constituencies right not to work across the divide but to actually say mm -hmm. how do you have conversations about these polarizing issues with people who look like you, sound like you, and disagree with you on some very fundamental issues. They vote differently than you do. And we are sort of calling it, you know, go talk to your uncle. And the, the idea behind that is in all of our families and all of our extended families and our extended networks, there are people with whom we disagree, yet we don't choose to have the conversations with them because that's oh, too much trouble. I don't want to rock the boat. I'm going to have to see them at Thanksgiving. I'm going to have to see them over the holidays. I just, I, I don't have time for it. And frankly, many of my African-American friends, other friends of color will say to me, that's exactly you as a, in your socioeconomic status, upper middle class, white person who lives in the northeast of the United States, you should be having those conversations with your uncle who doesn't vote like you, who thinks differently than you do, because you have the ability to have more influence. And that's actually exactly the kind of work we were doing in Burundi, was working with leaders of communities to have conversations with their own communities, because they were persuaded that a different approach to solving the problem was a useful, helpful one. And it's not about always bridging the divide. It's about being able to bring some nuance back into that conversation. That's fascinating. So you're, you're recreating the ability to have productive political discussion Within, internally. yes. That's great. I see a hand. Yes, please. Hi, Martin Johnson. I'm wondering on the topic of conversations, how do you structure conversations to discuss emotions objectively? So specifically in context when one of the groups, one of the parties in negotiation carries much of the emotional burden. So when women are talking about abortion rights or when we're talking about racial discrimination, how do you allow for that emotional value to still have value in the conversation, but to also be looked at objectively and not just kind of written off as like, oh, that's only your subjective emotional and irrelevant opinion. <laughs> Tough question. We're, we're kind of each trying to pass it off on the other. <laughs> I'm sure there are many people in the room we have ideas. Um, I think one of the ways that I work is I design the meeting so that it makes space for those kinds of interactions. So, so there wouldn't be mom. I can't. I would be trying to design to protect against moments where there is an emotional outburst, and that person then feels um, shut down because that emotional outburst wasn't well received. So it's more um, depending on the specifics, right? So how do you lead into what are emotionally laden aspects of the conversation so that there's a build up to it and a, an opening for those kinds of discussions? 
I would say something that we do, and I think many people who are familiar here at Harvard Law School with the difficult conversations and some of the other work that's been done, is that you may want to start almost like a pre-negotiation, right? A pre session where you spend some time with parties on their own because we would suggest that the emotions are emotions actually help us think if we weren't if we didn't have emotions we would have a really tough time making decisions in fact there's a lot of good brain science to support that so you don't you can't take emotions out of the conversation and in fact I would argue you don't want to because that's a large part how you want to help people understand the other's experience of discrimination, for example. Um, so how can you work uh, to, with the parties both separately and together to make sure that emotions are acknowledged and um, inform the conversation effectively without overwhelming the conversation such that you <coughs> create a situation that Susan's trying to say she tries to create an approach to avoid where one or another party shuts down. So we do spend time on understanding one's own triggers, uh, these, the hot buttons exercise about what kinds of language, vocabulary can serve as triggers. How might you then get agreement from the parties around the table to acknowledge those triggers and then collectively agree or to not use them in this conversation, et cetera. So I think there are several approaches that can be used while honoring the importance of those emotions and recognizing that without them, we, we'd have a very sterile world. Right? That's really important. Yes, please. So but do I detect a certain reticence in, uh, uh, in uh, identifying terms, uh, analytic terms that might be applicable. Because, I mean, it seems to me, I mean, you know, you have uh, Keynes, who's very much out of favor, except on the pages of the New York Times, in many economics departments. You have uh, Freud, or, you know, you have even Marx. Uh, I mean, uh, some of the, these are terms, uh, class conflict, uh, uh, de economic demand, the, the need for economic demand. Uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, are, are any of you or people associated with, are, are, are any of you attempting to do conflict mediation in the uh, U.S. House and Senate? Be where, where, I mean, where we have gridlock and, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's and, and, and it, it's not, I think it's not the absence of terms, it's, it's, the, it's the reluctance to use terms that uh, is maybe symptomatic of people who have a vested interest in the status quo uh, and, and, and in the gridlock, uh, which is uh, serving the interests of the, if you'll pardon my saying so, the 1% or the 5% of the wealthiest among us. And those, as well as certainly those of us who are certain that we are about to be entering that elite group. And uh, that, that certainly is, 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 is ever, you know, is, is ever, uh, an ever receiving uh, 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 outcome. That is, it never seems to arrive. I know that I'm in that number. Thanks. I think some of the things you're pointing to are those things that need to be discussed um, and that are not being discussed. That's, that's what we're, that the polarization is creating a lack of ability to have the political discussions that need to be had. And so we're sitting here saying, how could we, because I don't think this is about teaching um, members of Congress how to communicate. I think this is this polarization the members of Congress are reflective of the polarization that exists for many, many reasons and you know we'll leave that to the political scientists. But I can say that when I did work um, in the Senate, it was very clear to me that the 
the gridlock in the Senate is reflective of the gridlock among lobbyists. And the gridlock among lobbyists is reflective of, have, of their being representatives of organizations that have vast memberships and can only agree on minimal uh, terms. And so their lobbyists are then limited in what they can say. And so the gridlock, is, the roots of the gridlock are so deep um, that, uh, that it's a much, much bigger uh, question. I, I'm concerned right now, really, with the polarization among the population, which I think is, might then, if we can get some nuanced discussions going, might then be able to move things in another direction. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, I, 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 my, your comments about faith sort of made me have crystallized the thought I've been thinking about that I think it might be about a prioritization of values. I think one side prioritizes loyalty at the very top. I think the other side prioritizes fairness at the very top. And I think that you know, some loyalty can have its purposes, but I think it can also hide and cover over misdeeds. But people are loyal to their tribe, and so if you, if you go beyond the parameters, you're disloyal. People say, well, you're disloyal to the president or the country. And the other side, fairness, if it's sometimes they'll look at, oh, it's not fair, it's about being politically correct, but fairness is more important, fairness for all versus fairness for the tribe, and I guess I'm, Wondering if, like you're saying, that faith, it's sort of like, to me, that feels like the core battle that's mm -hmm. happening. I'm just wondering what you think of that. I have a hunch that both sides are constrained by issues of loyalty and fairness. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's one or the other. I think those are very key terms for the dynamics that we're seeing. But I think both sides view themselves as working towards a more fair future, and I think both sides demand loyalty. Uh, good. Yeah. Uh, I'm Monica. Um, thank you for both of you. This has been really great. I want to kind of ask a question bridging something that you both said. The first is the idea of go ask your uncle, which I think is um, great and really interesting. Combining that with what you said earlier, Susan, about this being maybe something unique and there's a faith element of this. Um, how do we kind of think about those two things together when we're having this conversation with our uncle, but there's something very different about what's actually happened between us? And what are what's kind of the goal of that conversation? And what are some tools that we can use that maybe are different from the typical frameworks or processes that we think about when kind of engaging these conversations? So I think that's a great question, Monica, and one of the things that um, I had thought I might ask Susan too, which was how, what is our goal in these conversations, right? What, I think that's a critical question because um, I had a guest lecturer in my class yesterday and he is, uh, works at Mercy Corps, a big humanitarian relief and development organization that has decided to go off on his own to part time to work on bridging the urban rural divide in America with just a very small effort to build relationship between people who simply, because of the way uh, we are structured both purposely as individuals and then collectively as we become more segregated, just don't get together, don't talk to each other, don't see each other, don't have much of a relationship with one another. So it's called, it's an effort called double decathlon and the idea is you bring people together to have fun and maybe you build a relationship and maybe much down the line you might have a, conversa a difficult conversation. <laughs> but his goal is not to do anything other than to help people meet someone who is not like them, doesn't think like them, et cetera. So I, and on the one hand, you might say, well, so what? Is that really going to help? Uh, what? And I would suggest that a lot of the work that we do is to uh, try and build relationships first. Just bring people together. So um, by talking with your crazy uncle or the person you deem as crazy when he really thinks you're crazy, right, for the way you think, is building, it, taking a step to actually have a different kind of relationship. It's not just you're my uncle, so therefore 
your family, so therefore we have a relationship. It's actually maybe constructing, if you will, a, a new relationship between us and, and then trying to decide can we build enough trust to talk about issues that we feel quite differently about. So that to me would be where you're beginning to change the goal for the next set of conversations and think differently about maybe problem solving. But we will say in our work that you, you may need to separate the, the, the steps, not mix up trying to build relationships with problem solving right at the beginning because the people with whom you're working won't have enough trust in one another, enough shared faith on anything that they will be able to engage in a problem solving process. So, so I, I would just add, um, when, when the abortion talks went public with an article in the Boston Globe, we got thousands of emails from around the world. And many of them said things, they thanked the women for participating in it and said, if, if you all could have that conversation, then I'm gonna try to have a conversation with my sister, with my uncle, that I was never able to have before. And I think we might consider a goal of creating muscle memory for a nuanced conversation in support of our democracy. That's, that's what I think we're losing. If democracy is a system that allows for conflict without violence, then that's what we need to protect. And the polarization threatens it. So maybe that's a goal that we can have, is to choose to have discussions with the people who are our friends, our family members, people who we love outside of politics, um, and engage. Because then maybe if we can engage with them, we can build that muscle memory to engage with the person we meet on an airplane and have a nuanced conversation uh, to start building things back. Great, and I think we're exactly at one o'clock, which was a beautiful conclusion, Susan, so I'll just say thank you. Thank you. <laughs>